I, I try to really get a, a vibe for what the Lord wants to do during that particular day, uh, during that particular gathering, and really to try to get the pulse of the Holy Spirit. And uh, during worship, I just really felt like over and over I heard the Holy Spirit whispering something into my heart, something very specific. Tell them that they are as full as they want to be. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So the level of your infilling is directly proportionate to the hunger you have expressed. And so I believe those of you who are putting God at the forefront of your year that you are setting yourself up to be more full of God than you have ever been. Because what we don't understand is that we lift our lives to God and we say, God, fill us. And the Lord says, where's the room? Remember that story about the widow who was completely indebted and her husband passed away? And she went to the prophet and she asked him, what am I supposed to do to get out of this debt? And he told her, he said, I want you to go and I want you to gather all the empty oil vessels that you can find. And the story bears out that she found empty oil vessels. She even borrowed oil vessels that were partially full. And she brought them into her home at the work of her sons. And then she took a jar of oil that was in her house. Just one jar. It's all she had left. And she started pouring. And the Bible says that every single vessel that was put in front of that jar of oil was completely filled. The lesson from that is this, that heaven never ran out of oil. The earth ran out of emptiness. You are as full as you want to be. And so something has to happen in us where we begin to, to, I believe, be obedient to the Holy Spirit, be yielded to the Holy Spirit, and we allow God to move stuff out of our life so that God can move in to our life. Anybody with me in this place? So there's this passage of Scripture that's been uh, stirring my heart for quite some time. And coming into the new year, I absolutely could not get away from it. And I, I'd say Three Trees is probably tired of hearing me talk about it, but i still got a few more Sundays to talk on it. And we'll talk to you guys about it tonight. And it's Acts chapter 17, verse 6. And the end portion of that passage of Scripture, it just simply says this. It says, These that have turned the world upside down have come here also. Acts chapter 17, verse 6. These that have turned the world upside down have come here also. I just want to ask you, have they made it to Camelsville yet? Are you with me? What happens in this passage of Scripture probably needs to be put into context with an event that transpires and is recorded in Acts chapter 26. It's verse 13 if you want to turn there with me. Acts chapter 26, verse 13, it says, At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun. This is the apostle Paul, and he is giving his testimony of his salvation experience to King Agrippa. And so he says, I saw a vision, and, and, and it had a bright light with it, and it shone round about me, and even everybody that journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me, in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Goes on in verse 15 to say, and I, Lord, who, who are you that's accusing me of the persecution? And the Lord said, I am Jesus. Verse 16, but rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose. God will never appear to you without a purpose. If you have had an experience with God, there is a very clear reason for that experience. It is because God wanted to unveil a purpose that he has for you in your life. And so it goes on to say what that purpose is, specifically in verse 17, that you will, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. You realize even to this day there's some folks that were sent and there's some folks that just went. God told Paul, he said, I'm about to send you. Verse 18, you have a purpose. You're going to open their eyes. Just tell your neighbor, open your eyes. So that they may turn, that they may turn, that they may turn from oh, that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So Paul is being told, you are being given a specific mission, and that mission is to go and to turn darkness 
to light. Does anybody in this place maybe think that our culture needs to experience a turn from darkness to light? He's also, he's also told that he's supposed to be used of God to turn the power of Satan over with the power of God. I think the enemy has been on the throne long enough. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. It is time to overturn his power. If there's a stronghold in your life from Satan or from the enemy, the same, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead now dwells in you. And therefore, whatever spirit you bind on earth should be bound in heaven, and whatever spirit you loose on earth should be loose in heaven. We've been putting up with too much. It is time to overturn Satan's power. And he also says that he is to be used to turn sin into salvation because there's going to be people who are going to receive forgiveness as Paul is sent. And so you get this picture of, of Saul who is persecuting the church. He has this vision of Jesus. It's a revelation of Jesus, if you will. And the result is, is that he seems to literally fall down and he becomes blinded. And this vision encapsulates everybody that's surrounding his party. And, 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 and while this is happening, he's not just seeing something, he's hearing something. And Jesus has given him this purpose. And that purpose was to be sent. And what's he going to do? He's going to turn darkness to light. He's going to turn Satan's power to God's power. And he's going to turn sin to salvation. Paul is not the only, only person that experienced this purpose. It says that his whole company was surrounded by this light. We know that there were a, a great variety of people that God began to use in the book of Acts. To the point that in Acts chapter 17, when the city officials began to try to describe this turning that was happening in their culture, the darkness to light, etc., the only way they knew how to describe those folks, they didn't call them Christians. They didn't call them the first church of the self-righteous. They simply said, these that have turned the world upside down have come here also. They were recognized descriptively by the turning that they were accomplishing in the earth. Now you tell me something. If God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then why is our culture becoming increasingly dark instead of increasingly bright? Why is it that it seems to be that culture is impacting the church at a greater level of capacity than the church is impacting culture? There is only one explanation, and it is this. We have not fully yielded ourselves to the Holy Spirit. Many of us have a revelation of Jesus, but we do not have a revelation of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And if we possess the revelation, then we have not yet yielded to it that it might be made manifest. Because I still believe in a God who gives us the authority to rebuke cancer and cancer's got to go. I still believe in a God that says that these signs shall follow those that believe. They will lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. They shall cast out demons. Anybody believe the Bible in this place? It is time for a turn. The only way that it can happen, though, is if we first allow God to turn us. So I want you just to look at somebody and tell them this. Say, those that turn the world upside down are coming here also. And tell them, because I'm one of them. I love, you look in 2 Kings chapter 9, there's this dude by the name of Je Jehu. And he was getting ready to come against Jezebel. Don't you think Jezebel sat on her throne long enough? And when the watchmen looked down to see who was coming down the road, they knew an attack was coming against Jezebel. They just didn't know who it was. They couldn't see the, the, the person's face through their telescope. So when they began to describe who they thought it might be, the watchman looked at the king and he said, All I know to say is that he drives like Jehu. You ever seen a vehicle go by and you didn't know who was driving it? by face, but you knew who was driving it by style. Listen, some of you are about to become known by the way in which you drive your praise and the way in which you drive your attack against the enemy. And you, and you need to get used to, you need to get a look at some, you need to get used to some bewildered looks 
and some self-righteous stares. Because when you start really going after God, you'll come in and sit down on their pew, and you'll see Beulah and Freddie grab their stuff and move to another section because they don't want to be near you. Just ask them. You want me to help you pack your stuff? <laughs> That's all. He said he got a whole thing reserved to himself. The turn. Some of us, I believe we need to yield to God in the capacity that we need to, to begin to turn off some things so that we can turn on to some God things. Maybe one of the biggest issues in our life in trying to yield to the Holy Spirit is that we are uh, overwhelmed with multitasking. We are uh, at a place in our lives where that there's so many distractions. A lot of the things that we call convenience has become nothing more than idols. Anything that takes a higher level of priority in your life than God is an idol. And if some of us check Scripture as often as we check our plates. I told our church the other day, I said, I challenge some of y'all, by the grace of God, to get off of Facebook and get your face in the book. And make and come to a place of turning. Do you believe it's time to turn or not? Listen, I, I preach to our students every Wednesday night, 614, I go into that building, I hang out with them, I share the gospel with them. And, and, and I am seeing something transpire where that there is an increasing level of darkness come over this generation. And if you've got kids that are teenagers or even kids that are in elementary school right now, you had better be getting a burden for your home because hell is out to steal, to kill, and to destroy. We need some Joshuas who are going to stand up, make their back like a T-rail, and declare as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. You're waiting on your youth pastor to do it. You're waiting on your church to do it. And God's waiting on you to be the man of God, the woman of God in your home and finally declare a turn in your house. So I feel like tonight I need to ask you a few questions. The first question I want to ask you is, have we rationalized the acceptance of mediocrity? I've uh, went through some health battles and I had to actually go to the one of the things that's happened as a result of that is my immune system's giving me some issues and I have to go get a, a steroid shot. And, and so if I'm limping today, it's because uh, a nurse got a hold of me or, or earlier. And uh, uh, gl glory to God. The, the thing of it is this, that uh, uh, I, I said Jacob walked with a limp. And may, maybe I'll have to walk with a limp today. But I, I've learned a lot about God in everything that I've went through in the health battle. And even while I was sitting in the doctor's office today, my appointment was at 11. I didn't get to see the doctor till 1.30. And I'm sitting out there in the waiting room, and, and I'm thinking, man, I, I'm preaching tonight, and I want to be alone with God. And, and I suddenly realized I can yield to the Lord even sitting here in this waiting room. You ain't, you ain't with me. I said, I can yield to the Lord even sitting here in this waiting room. And so it, it, while I was sitting in a waiting room, and I was preparing my mind to come and share the word with you guys this evening, I felt like I heard the Lord ask me, have you rationalized the acceptance of mediocrity? Because I think we have begun to rationalize why we have mediocre worship gatherings. A lot of times, if you notice, we say God was here when he wasn't anywhere near the place. There's a lot of churches today that are stuck in a traditional bondage that they literally believe that they could get a better worship band, if they could get a better preacher, if they could get more technology, that they would have a move of God. But I've traveled a lot out there, and I'll tell you something, what I've experienced is that there's a lot of places who have all of those bells and all of those whistles, and they still have a mediocre presence of God. Am I making sense to anybody in this building? And so I think sometimes we say, I don't walk in the power of God because I don't have time to pray. Nobody has time to pray. you got to make time. I think we, we rationalize our mediocre understanding of the word by saying, I don't understand it. So therefore, that, that negates me from needing to read it or to dive into it, or to say, listen, if you don't understand it, then how much more the fuel to keep digging in it and inviting the Holy Spirit to reveal something to you? 
And so I believe that there have been multitudes of people that have rationalized the mediocre by saying, if somebody else would do this, then I would do that. Or if I had all of these little things in perfect alignment, you will never be ready to go to the next level. So stop rationalizing why you're not yet there and make up your mind that you're going to allow God to turn you from the inside out. Your mind is going to be renewed. Your hands are going to be clean. Your heart is going to be purified. And the result is the turn happens in you. This little icon and logo that you see behind me, it, it, uh, it's it got the, the house, one house that's right side up, and it's got the other house that's upside down. And so some of us are going to have to allow God to turn us right side up so that we can go forth and turn the world upside down. What I found in the kingdom of God is what is up in the world is down in the kingdom, and what's down in the kingdom is up in the world. For instance, the Bible says if you humble yourself, God will exalt you. But if you exalt yourself, God will see to it that you get humbled. And so we're trying to exalt our... We're rationalizing the mediocre, mediocrity by saying if somebody would give me this chance or somebody would give me this opportunity, then I could be all that God's destining me to be. Can you imagine what it was like when Saul announced he had received Jesus Christ as Savior? And he had been the guy who had stood ringside when they killed one of the greatest Christian leaders of that day, a man by the name of Stephen. Can you imagine what people thought that he was just trying to infiltrate Christianity so that he could further persecute it and from the inside out? Can you imagine? I doubt that a lot of opportunities opened up for him to get to speak all of a sudden. But he stayed yielded to God. And the result was is that that man would go on to write two-thirds of the New Testament that you now hold in your hand. They would throw him in prison, and he would say, just give me a pen and a piece of paper. If that's the only way I can communicate, then I'll write my way out of this situation. He got so full of God that there came a moment in Lystra where he was preaching. They grabbed him by the nap of the neck, drug him out into the city streets, took stones, and started throwing them at him until they literally thought he was dead. And when the crowd left him, he got up, dusted himself off, stitched himself up, walked back into Lystra, and preached one more time. And you're complaining about not having an opportunity? You're complaining about nobody will recognize your gift and nobody sees your anointing and nobody will look at your ideas or hear your ideas? How about you get full of God? And when they sown you a stuff right, you say, I'm telling you, if you'll get the anointing on your life, the anointing will make room for you. You'll try to hide and not be able to. Turn. Hallelujah. So I'm going to ask you, have you rationalized your mediocrity in God. I ask you a second question. Have we made the truth of God a lie? Let you look at this passage of Scripture. This, this Scripture messed with me. I've chewed on it ever since the, the moment that I ran across it afresh a few days ago. It's John chapter 16, verse 7. It says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. This is Jesus talking. Tell somebody, it's Jesus talking. He said, it is to your advantage. Do you see this? That I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, also known as the Holy Ghost, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Somebody has got to get this. That Jesus Christ was walking on the earth in the flesh. And he looks at his disciples and says, I have to get out of here in the physical so that if I go, I can have a Holy Ghost tag team handoff to the Holy Spirit who then he can come and he'll be your helper, he'll be your counselor, he'll be your empowerer. But the longer I stand here, the longer I keep him from being able to come. What Jesus was trying to say is that while I'm here, I'm with you. But when the Holy Spirit gets here, he's going to get in you and the Holy Spirit represents God in you and so for Jesus to say it is to my advantage if you leave because Jesus said because of the Holy Spirit if you put it in context greater works will you do than even Jesus himself did and I want to know where is that church at amen where are those people at tell me those that have turned the world upside down 
Have they come to Campbellsville also? Have they come to your home also? Have they come to your prayer closet also? Because I believe with all of my heart that Jesus said what he meant and he meant what he said. And if he said it was to my advantage for him to go to heaven so the Holy Spirit could come to me, then I want to take him at his word and I want that Holy Ghost in my life. And what we're seeing is we are, we are struggling across the entire scope of the church to be able to see a fulfillment of, of, of reaching the capacity in the power of God that Jesus possessed. And so if Jesus said it's to my advantage, it's to your advantage if I go, then I, I want to step into that place where that finally the greater works that Jesus prophesied of are finally being made manifest through his people that are yielding to him. One of the biggest issues that the world takes with us is our hypocrisy. I mean, I don't know about you, but I invite a lot of people to church. Derry Bragg, he's with us today from, from Three Trees. And, and last year, we had uh, connection cards that people fill out during service. And, and, and we had over 75 cards that at the bottom of them, where they said, how'd you hear about Three Trees? They wrote, Derry Bragg. And some of them couldn't even spell it right, Derry. And they... They had, it, they had it spelled with I and E and brag with one G instead of two and I had it all messed up. He's constantly inviting people to church. And I don't know what Derry runs into, but I know what I run into. I hear people say stuff like, why would I want to come to church? It's full of a bunch of hypocrites. Hypocrites in the seats, hypocrites on the stage, hypocrites singing, hypocrites preaching. Yeah, y'all looking holy right now. Some of y'all know you'd have come to church a lot sooner if it hadn't been for some hypocrite standing on a stage somewhere. And you use it as your excuse to keep you from the house of God. And there's people who are in that same thing. So I've come up with a brand new line. I just look at them and say, why don't you come help me change it? I had an uncle one time. And he said, uh, so he was inviting somebody to church. And they kind of gave him that line. It's just full of a bunch of, bunch of hypocrites and people just devil, etc. He looked at him and he said, well, you can go to church with the devil or you can go to hell with him. It's your decision. But here's the deal, guys. If we really had that Holy Ghost living on the inside of us, if we were really, truly, it's not only think it's a question of him living on the inside of many of us, I think it's a question of us yielding to him. If we had truly yielded to him, wouldn't we walk in a greater level of power and wouldn't our hypocrisy be less often? So I, 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 wanna, I, want, I don't want to make the truth of God into a lie because the Word of God is supposed to never return void. And there's only one place in Scripture that you can find that the Word was made void. And it was when Pharisees were told by Jesus they had made it void because they had it in their mind but they didn't have it in their heart. So may we yield. I ask you a question. Do you have a revelation of Jesus as Savior? but perhaps have not yielded to the Holy Spirit's empowerment. That maybe the Holy Ghost is already dealing with your life, but yet you need that experience like Paul. Here's what the Bible says about Paul. It says that he saw Jesus. He was blinded by it. They took Paul and they put him in a house for three days. He laid there blind. And a man by the name of Ananias came by his house. And when Ananias got there, he, he, he told Paul many things from the Lord. But one of the things that happened is that Ananias laid his hands on Paul. And he said, your blindness is going to be taken away. And you are going to walk being filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And what we see in Paul's life is that from that moment forward, as I told you earlier, he was never the same. And so... I don't know tonight that you even need a man's hands to get a hold of you. Maybe you just need your hands to get up in the air and finally say, God, I surrender to your Holy Spirit. And God, if you want to use me to turn the darkness on my workplace to light, if you want to use me to overturn Satan's power in my school to the power of God, are you following me? Then, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I yield to you so that your Holy Spirit can be made manifest. If it is to our advantage then why would we not seize that advantage? I, uh, I heard the story of a man 500 years ago that was preaching in, uh, in his city and he was serving communion at the end of the service. And he was living in a time in which the Libertines were taking over culture. The Libertines were a group of people who took the grace of God 
and perverted it. They began to use grace as an excuse to be sexually promiscuous, to live in constant immorality, and to be drunkards. And they were coming into church and living in this hypocrisy and actually fulfilling church leadership roles. And this, this pastor began to stand up and say, this ought not be. Grace is not a license to sin. Grace is an empowerment to set you free from sin. And so there came an evening where he was serving communion and, and these libertines all lined up and they were going to come and take communion and serve it amongst themselves. And something about that struck him wrong. And he said, this ought not be that they're going to mock God openly. And here I am, the spiritual leader of this house. I can't stand back and see it take place. And so he grabs a hold of the communion elements and these people, these libertines gum and begin to try to rip it from his hands. And he says something along these lines. You may take this from my cold dead hands, but I will never stand idly by while you revile my God. They got so upset that they drug him out of his town. Three years later, the libertines were beginning to be overturned by the government of that day. And that same pastor would walk back into that same town, find that same church, step up behind that same pulpit, open up the same Bible, and start preaching from the exact same scripture he had stopped at three years ago. I believe God wants to raise up some people who will turn. Even if it means that there's persecution that comes to your life. I don't think, I, I don't think America is ready for where we're headed. The Bible says all who live godly shall suffer persecution. I don't even know if you saw what happened in the news today. I don't have time to go into it, but it was another example of our culture turning increasingly dark and light attempting to be dimmed by Satan's power. You look at the church in Acts, take a look at it, and you'll find something that's really intriguing. They were blowing it up for Jesus in Jerusalem. They were growing like wildfire. But they had a mandate from the Holy Ghost to take the gospel into Samaria, Judea, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And by the time you get multiple chapters over into the book of Acts, they are still sitting in Jerusalem. Matter of fact, they're dealing with complaints about the widows aren't getting as much food as they would like. And they have to develop a consumer complaint department to deal with all the petty indifferences that was happening in the church. But then persecution came. And they started killing people for the gospel. And the same men, such as Stephen and Philip, who were in charge of the consumer complaint department, were out preaching the gospel and taking entire cities. Matter of fact, Philip turned Samaria upside down with evangelism by the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's what I see in that. They were not willing to go forth in the boldness of the Holy Spirit and advance the kingdom until persecution came. And America has been the greatest missionary force on the earth, and I am grateful for that. But I'm going to tell you something. The world isn't one yet. The world isn't one yet. How do I know that? Because some of us still got lost people in our homes. We're still standing in cubicles every day next to lost people. We're still walking down hallways with people who don't profess Jesus as Savior. We need the Holy Ghost. And I pray it doesn't take persecution to finally get us motivated to turn the world upside down. Can I get a witness in this place? Pray it don't take that. Pray it don't take that. So the turn. The turn. I'm going to ask you these three questions one more time. Have we rationalized the acceptance of mediocrity? Have we made the truth of God into a lie? Have we settled for a revelation of Jesus without fully yielding to the empowerment of His Holy Spirit? And do we understand this is that. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Verse 14, so that, say that with me, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Look at that. Christ redeemed you so that you might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus went to the cross, he was ultimately there to take, you, take your sins away from you. But this scripture clearly points out that one of the plans of redemption was to set you up to be able to receive the Holy Spirit overflowing in your life. Do you know that the Holy Spirit is that thing you've been missing? You've went to church services many times probably, and you've heard 
may be great oratory skills unleashed through points and poems. And you would walk away and you would say, that was good, but something was missing. That thing that was missing was the Holy Ghost. You've, you, you've went into prayer times before. And it's like your prayers weren't getting above the ceiling. And you couldn't understand why. Maybe that thing that was missing was the Holy Ghost. As the Lord was challenging you to further yield in some area of your life and for whatever reason you were being resistant and hesitant. Maybe. Maybe we need to hear Simon Peter step out on the balcony of the upper room when people were mocking the church for the experience they were taking, that was taking place. They were manifesting the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Every language that was present in that city was being spoken in native tongue by foreigners. Cloven tongues of fire set upon each one of them individually. The whole house was filled. And people from the outside are looking in and saying, those folks are drunk, they're crazy. And Simon Peter steps out. And he says, they are not drunk as you suppose. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. But this is that that Joel spoke of. That in the last days, the sons and the daughters would prophesy and the old men would dream dreams. That God would pour out His Spirit on all flesh. Look at your neighbor and tell them, all flesh. While you're there, tell them, that means you. The Holy Spirit is waiting to be poured out upon you. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 14 says that in the last days, God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. There will be no dry place. I'm ready for that flood, a gully washer of the Holy Ghost to come down. This is that. And what we don't realize is that the brokenness of Jesus' body is what made that possible. There are some ushers that have uh, some communion elements, and I believe they're going to begin to pass those out throughout the building. And your pastor is going to prepare to come, and he's going to lead us as a group of people uh, in a time of communion. And as we step into that time of communion, what I want you to realize is that when you recognize that that bread is the brokenness of Jesus, and when you see that cup and recognize it's the blood of Jesus poured out for the remission of sins, that that communion not only represents God's ability to save you, but it represents the common union that Jesus wants to have with you. Do you hear that? The common union that Jesus wants to have with you through the help of the Holy Spirit. And I realize tonight there may be some of you that are in this place and you are separated from Jesus. You have not professed Him as Savior. One of the things that the book of Acts says in Acts chapter 3 verse 19 is that we are supposed to repent so that we can turn to Jesus. Is there anything that you need to turn away from so that you can turn to Jesus? I want to ask every head to be bowed, every eye to be closed. They're going to, guys, go ahead and start passing that through. And as they're passing that through, I want to just lead us in a time of prayer. And I realize you may have to look up to grab the communion. They're just going to put it in your hands, and I want you just to hold it for just a moment, all right? We're going to pray together while this takes place. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now in the name of Jesus. And we recognize, Father, that there may be those of us in this place that are, that are, that are in sin. That there may be those of us that are completely separated from you, Jesus. That we have not received you as Savior. God, I pray right now now that if there be those like that in this place and their heart right now feels a draw feels a conviction feels a pull that father they would begin to yield themselves to you right now that they begin to ask you to come into their heart that they ask you to forgive them of their sins that they believe that you are forgiving them of those sins and that father they will confess that to those who are to those father who are in their lives and need to hear that change has come to them father god i pray for those of us who maybe are in this place and we've been away from jesus And right now, God, we need to turn back to Jesus being the first priority in our life and being the center of everything we do. Father God, what we pray that happens in us right now is a turning, a turning, a turning from whatever's kept us from you to you. And God, I further pray that there are those of us who have not completely yielded to the Holy Ghost and we're living powerless lives without reason. Father, you said in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 that you would bring the Holy Ghost and He would come upon us with power. And many of us, God, we feel like darkness is ruling our lives. We feel like, Father, that the enemy is beating up on us on all sides. We recognize that is the lie of hell and we don't have to settle for that. 
I'm going to ask if you would to lift your hand with me tonight. Father, we lift our hands and surrender to you. And we say, God, that we want to yield totally and completely to your Holy Spirit. We are grateful for the blood of Jesus Christ that washes our sins so that we can receive the work of the Holy Ghost in our lives. God, some of us, we've walked with you, but we've not nurtured you in us. Holy Ghost, come in us. Come in us with a fire that hell has no answer for. Baptize us afresh and anew with your fire. Father God, I pray that there will be the people in this place tonight that will never be the same from this moment forward. Never be the same from this moment. These hands are lifted as a sign of surrender to you, God. Completely surrendered. Completely surrendered. I'm going to ask you to stand with me to your feet. I'm going to ask you to take uh, that communion element. And uh, there's, a, there's a saran wrap that you can pull off the top that will give you the bread. There's a foil you can pull off that will give you the cup. And I want you to hold the bread in one hand and obviously hold the cup in another. And if you're here tonight and, uh, and, and just a moment ago you prayed that prayer and you received Christ as your Savior, maybe for the first time ever, you received Christ as your Savior, I want you to lift your hand if that's you. If you received Christ as your Savior a moment ago while we were praying that prayer, is there anybody in this place that you said just a moment ago, I got saved, I made Jesus my Lord. I accepted him. Amen. Amen. Is there anybody in this place that you say a few moments ago, I turned back to Jesus. I'd been disconnected from the Lord in my life. I I, I'd felt like that there was just a part of me that wasn't totally dedicated to him, and I've turned back to the Lord. Would you confess that right now with a lifting hand? Anybody in this place that would be bold and say, that's me. I did that for Jesus. He pulled me. He tugged on my heart. Pastor Brian is going to come. Here's what we're going to do. We're gonna, he's going to lead us in communion, and we're as a church, we're going to honor God in this capacity. And uh, I believe that the Lord wants to bring us...